Good to be with you guys. This morning we're going to be in Luke chapter 12, so let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 12. Um, I missed answering some questions last week. I apologize for that. I was looking for them on my phone right now. I didn't see them, but I will uh, find them. I think either I have an email or I have it somewhere, so I will uh, find those and put them on the Cornerstone Facebook page, so I'll be doing that. So, If you are available tomorrow at 2 o'clock, um, I invite you to join me. We have, uh, we have 500 little business card size invitations uh, to the Light of Life Festival, and we're going to be handing them out to the families uh, tomorrow as they uh, come to pick up their kids at school right across the street. I checked with the, uh, the administration there, and they're all, they're all for it. So if you're free at 2 o'clock, probably just about a half an hour, I think they get out at 2.20, but if you could be here at 2, uh, we're going to just kind of say hi to moms and dads as they pick up their kids and invite them to the, uh, to the Light of Life Festival on Thursday. So join me at 2 o'clock. That'd be great. Uh, we are in Luke chapter 12, and we are going to be starting in verse 35. In, in the previous section, Jesus has been uh, telling his disciples to not worry. Look at verse 22. Don't worry about your life, what you will eat, about your body, what you will put on. He's been encouraging them to not worry about uh, the things that they need in life. Uh, previously, in verse 16, he talked about a rich man that had a plentiful, plentiful harvest and was trusting in his riches and was not considering uh, the fact that his life would end soon. And so he was teaching uh, against uh, the dangers of greed and also the dangers of worry. And now he's going to be shifting gears a little bit and uh, encouraging the listeners to be looking for his coming, to be ready for the return of Jesus. So verse 35 Luke chapter 12, verse 35, Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that, he, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. So we're going to be finishing the chapter today. That's just a little bit of a preview. I'd like to uh, say a prayer here before we get going and to ask God's blessing on our time. So. Lord, thank you so very, very much for your graciousness, Lord, your grace and mercy to us, your love, your compassion. The Bible says that you are long-suffering, that you're faithful, Lord. Um, you are mighty to save and mighty to help us, so thank you. I pray, Lord, that we would be a people here today that are looking for your return, Lord, that we are not uh, distracted with the cares of the world and overly caught up with the things of the world so that we're not expecting to see you at any moment. So, Lord, we commit this time to you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, thank you. Amen. You know, as I was reading this um, passage, um, I was reminded about uh, how the United States was pulled into World War II, <clears throat> excuse me, in December of 1941. Um, there was a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor and uh, th the signs were there, you know. Um, even in the 30s, the Japanese uh, Imperial Army was making excursions like into the Philippines and the South, South Pacific. Uh, they were trying to uh, take islands both from the United States and from the Dutch colonies and also from France and Great Britain. They were extending, they were seeking to extend their kingdom. And in 1940, uh, the war was already going and uh, Germany and Italy had an alliance together. 1940, Japan joined that alliance. And so now uh, there was a world war kind of uh, in Europe and also in the South Pacific. And so on two fronts, there was a war. And the United States was kind of thinking, do we, get, do we really want to get involved in this, you know? And then, uh, and then the attack came on Pearl Harbor. It's interesting, in reading about it last night, the, the historical um, articles about it, uh, Japan practiced that attack. They studied Pearl Harbor. They knew that if they attacked on a Sunday, most of the soldiers would be in church or they, they would have the day off. Most of the anti-aircraft uh, uh, artillery was not even up and running. They, just, they, they hardly had any soldiers on, on lookout at all on that day. And uh, there was even some new radar that had been installed from, that was uh, received from Great Britain. And they picked up a large mass of airplanes coming in from the north. 
And the guy that was on the radar told his commanding officer, hey, I'm getting something huge here. And he goes, oh, that's, those are just B-17s. They're just making a practice run. They didn't even report it to anybody to, to make sure that that's what it was. They never imagined that Japan would attack Pearl Harbor. And then, of course, we know the story. And they especially never imagined that they would come from the north. They, they thought that they would come from the south. They had to go a long ways to come from the north. They, they caught our military completely off guard and did a lot of destruction, and over 2,000 lives were lost because our military wasn't expecting it. And this is exactly what Jesus is talking about here. He says, you need to live, if you're my follower, if you're my servant, if you're a Christian, you need to live every day with the readiness that I could come back any time. And so Jesus, this is a very, very strong passage. There's no hallmark card to be found in this chapter. There's no smiley face. There's no little happy post-it note with a little smiley face that you're going to put on the refrigerator. This is a chapter just simply full of warnings. And uh, there, there are, take it back, there are a couple of high points. Well, it's all good. I, I don't want to dig myself a hole here as a heretic, you know. Uh, but this is a very, very intense chapter. So uh, buckle up your spiritual seatbelts and we're going to get going here. As I said, Jesus was warning them about the, the danger of being greedy. He was warning them about the danger of worrying about what you're going to buy or have eat, what you're going to wear. And now he's telling them uh, to add to that a mindfulness that he could come at any time. Let's look at verses 35 to 40. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants. And that word blessed, markarios, in the Greek language, it means, oh, how happy. Oh, how fortunate. Oh, how good it is for those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. Verse 38, and if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed, oh, how happy are those servants. But know this, verse 39, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, and we always have that little saying, don't we? Whenever you see a therefore, you have to ask what it's Therefore, since all these things are true, what's the application? You be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So, in verse 35, he talks about having a waist girded and lamps burning, and in those days, the men would wear long robes. Kind of hard to work with a long robe. I don't know that by experience. That's just what they say in the books. Um, but if you have a long robe and you need to run, you need to fight, you need to to work hard, they would pull it up between their legs and then tuck it into their belt in front so they would, it would free up their legs. So basically it made them functional for service, for fighting, for working, whatever the case would be. So he's saying be, be living your life in such a way that you're always ready uh, to be active and you're always ready to serve and you're always ready to, to be on the lookout for whatever is coming. And of course having your lamps burning, it just simply means you need to be able to see what you're doing. You, know, you walk into a dark room, first thing you do is flip on the light. Or else, you know, if you're going to be stepping on Legos or kicking the coffee table or something, you know. It says in Psalm 119, your word, God, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And I love that because the word of God, notice, notice there's two applications there in that Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet. It shows me where I'm at. If I'm, if I'm reading God's word, it reveals to me what my, what's going on in my heart. If I'm, if I'm reading God's word, it reveals to me what's going on in my mind. It reveals to me the people that I have surrounding me. It reveals to me, shows me the things that I'm doing, if they're proper or not, if they're of God or not. The word of God shows me what's going on in the here and the now, and then the word of God also is a light to my path. It shows me where I'm supposed to be going. Guys, how important is it to read your Bible? It doesn't make you more saved, but it makes life a whole lot better. If you don't believe that, then get rid of all the lights in your house. Just throw them all away. Just, you know, cut the electricity. No candles allowed. No light at all. Just try to live that way. You'll see the inconvenience of it and how it makes life very difficult. Spiritually speaking, the same application is true. 
if we are not in God's word, if we're not letting it show us what's going on right now in the here and the now and then what's going on perhaps next week and we have plans, maybe we're going to sell the house and buy a new house, we're going to move to another, we hate California, we're going to move to a red state and you know, all these other things, okay, fine. As long as God's word is showing you where you're going and what you're doing. So Jesus said, if you're going to live ready, you have to be ready for action and you have to be able to see clearly. He, verse 36, he talks about waiting for that knock at the door. The followers of Jesus ready to, need to be ready to hear the knock on the door. You know, it didn't occur to me until right at this minute, but if you have the stereo blasting at 11 all the time, if you, any Spinal Tap fans, it goes to 11. The amplifiers, they go to 11. They only go to 10, but in Spinal Tap, they go to 11. So if you have all this noise going on, you're not going to hear the knock at the door. Is there so much noise going on in your life? And that's not just physical noise, but emotional, mental, psychological, any kind of noise going on in your life that you can't hear the knock at the door. Verse 37, Jesus said when he returns that he will serve us, which is an unbelievable thought. And I don't fully understand that. The, the, the book of the Revelation talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. When there's a wedding, you know, there's, there's always a reception after the bride and the groom have been joined together, and it speaks of us as the bride of Christ being joined together with Jesus, and then the celebration that follows, and usually, and in in, will always in this life, we are the ones serving him. It says when we are there with him that he's going to serve us, which is just an amazing thing to think about. That's not all that's going to happen, but some of that's going to happen. And so Jesus said, oh, how happy, look at verse 37, guys. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Are you watching for Jesus? Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. I, I just, I can't quite get my head around that thing, and I'm not just using that as a, as a cliche or a phrase. Theologically, I just, I don't know all that that means, but it just sounds wonderful. And Jesus said it, that he's going to be serving us. Who's going to experience that? Those who are watching. Those who are not watching will never know that moment. They will never know that moment. Verse 38, and if he should come in the second watch, which was 9 to 12, or if he should come to the third watch, which was midnight to 3 in the morning, blessed are those servants, which means they're always watching. They're sleeping with one eye open. Uh, a lot of you guys know we have a whole bunch of grandkids, and they, they like to spend the night, and they come over a lot. Honestly, Debbie sleeps with one eye open and both her ears on all the time. I mean, she can hear a, a grandkid, you know, shuffle a piece of paper three rooms away. I mean, she's just always, she's just always like, you know, it's just, just an awareness that I have to just, I have to be listening. Me, I'm just like, you know, the, the rhinoceros, you know. But, uh, but, but she, she's just, she's, she's always just tuning into that. That's how we're supposed to live as Christians. We're supposed to be tuning in to Jesus. It doesn't mean that we don't do other things. You can be working, but, but just have an ear open for Jesus. You can be playing, you can be on recreation, you can be on vacation, you can be doing any, any of those things with an ear open, listening for the knock at the door. And that's, that's what Jesus said, that's how we're supposed to live. So readiness, he says here in verse 38, um, is not sitting on the couch doing nothing, Readiness speaks of living a full life, but once again, with one ear always open, listening for the knock on the door. Look at, look at your notes there, Luke 19, verse 13. Jesus said, do business till I come. In other words, carry on. Don't just be, you know, go, go to the top of Westwood Hills and try to get yourself into the lotus position and, you know, sit and just, oh, Jesus, you know, I ran out my credit cards. Please come quick. You know, the, the, cre <laughs> the creditors are going to find me and, you know, Please come quick, Jesus. That's not what, you know, hoping for Jesus to come quick is about. It's not about the credit card debt. It's not about escapism, though it may be in a, in, a, in a holy way it is. I wouldn't mind being away from a lot of this stuff, you know. But there's a lot of it that I love. I mean, my family and friends and a lot of things and, you know. But the person who is waiting for Jesus is not just doing nothing. They're occupying. They're, look at your notes there. I love the old King James that says, occupy till I come. So stay busy be doing your thing, but with an ear towards the knock about Jesus. I mean, it's like expecting an Amazon package, isn't it? You know, especially those ones that you have to sign for. 
You know, you're vacuuming, you're cooking, you're in the backyard, the garden, you know, gardening, you're in whatever it is, but you're like, are they going to ring the bell? You know, because I have to sign that thing, and if I don't sign that thing, they're going to take off and take my package with them, you know. It's, it's that kind of mentality. So Jesus said, you need to be looking for me. You need to be ready for me. Verse 39, know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Th thieves don't send an RSVP. You know, they don't, they don't announce when they're going to come in and break into your house. And Jesus said just the same way, you need to be ready for me all the time because I could come at any time. Verse 40, therefore, you also be ready. He's saying all these truths, guys. He's saying all of these things are true. Every single one of them. They're all true. So if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've given your life to Jesus, he says, you need to be waiting for me. You need to be expecting me. Stay busy, do your thing, go on vacation, work your jobs, have your hobby, have your dinners, take care of the kids, take care of the grandkids, do the gardening, all of these things, but you be listening and you be ready because I'm coming at a time when you don't expect it. Verse 40, you also be ready. The Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not, not expect it. So the... The Christian, the follower of Jesus, needs to live in readiness all of the time. What's the opposite of that? Just, just kind of not caring. It's like having, having it in your head, yeah, I know Jesus is coming back someday, but you know, I'm not really ready for that yet because I'm doing this thing over here, and so I hope he doesn't come for the next three months because I've got this crazy party planned. And I'll, I'll apologize after that. Or I've got this thing that I'm doing over here. And I know I probably shouldn't be doing it. And, you know, this person and that thing, these investments and these activities and these things. And, you know, I just hope he doesn't, I just got to get this out of my system. You know, I just have to do this thing. This is the, you know, all my friends are telling me this is the chance of a lifetime. You got to do this thing. And I probably shouldn't. But, you know, if you're, if you're living like that, there's no guarantee he's not going to come in the middle of it. I'm not trying to scare you. That's just what the Bible says. It's just what the Bible says. I, I, I dream a lot. And uh, not just during the day. <laughs> but, also, but also not. You may say I'm a dreamer. I'm not the only one. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I have these dreams. And oftentimes they're dreams like, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm late for class and I forgot all my homework. And I forgot that there's a test today. And then I go back to my locker and I can't remember my locker combination. You know all those things where it's like, you should be ready, but you're not. All those kinds of things. And you wake up and it's like, man, I'm glad that was just a dream, you know. That's how it's going to be for some people. Jesus is going to come and you're going to go. I mean, Larry Norman had that great song, didn't he? I wish we'd all been ready. I wish we would have been ready. Why aren't people ready? Is it lack of information? Not lack of information. It's just lack of belief or not taking Jesus seriously. Verses 41 to 44, Luke chapter 12, verse 41. Then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all people? In other words, how, how far does this warning extend? And Jesus said in verse 42, who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. So Peter is wondering who Jesus is saying, saying this to. And Jesus is, is saying, I'm saying it to whoever will listen. I'm not just saying it to those people over there because they're of this ethnicity or these people, they have this skin color or those people because they're conservative or those, I'm not just warning those people because they're not conservative or they're voting this way. He says, I'm saying this to everybody and it, it's an invitation to all, the whole world and it applies to whoever is, is listening. Jesus said he was speaking to whoever would believe him. And he's saying the person that believes in Jesus and that he's coming is faithful and he's wise. And the person that believes Jesus is coming will be given a promotion in God's kingdom. So if you're a follower of Jesus now and you're, and you're 
hanging in there and you're, you know, following the Lord and you're waiting for his return, when he comes, guess what? You get bumped up. I don't know exactly what that means, but you get some kind of, you get some kind of new reassignment where God is using you in his kingdom. The person that believes Jesus is coming will be provided for in the future. Look at verse 42. Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? There's future reward. There's future reward for the, for the Christian, for the follower of Jesus that's looking for him to return. There's future reward. I don't know what that looks like, but that's what it says. Verse 43, once again, blessed is that servant. Whenever you see the word blessed in the New Testament, you can say, oh, how happy. I, I, when when I, we first moved to, um, to Napa, I, I worked in, in the gardening business, worked for Archie for a while <laughs> and survived it, and uh, worked for Archie's brother, too, and survived that. And um, the, we had an account up in um, Oakville, it's on the left side of the highway. There's a little winery there, and there was a trellis with a trumpet vine on it. And that thing just grew, like, overnight. And you had to climb the ladder and climb up on the trellis to, to, to trim the dumb trumpet vine, you know? I don't like heights. I'm almost kind of afraid right here, you know? It's like, I'm teasing. But, you know, you had got to get up on the trellis, you know, to, to, to trim the trumpet vine, you know? And I'm like, oh, I hate this thing, you know? Why do they plant these things? You know, if Satan made anything, it's that, you know. It's, it's, you know, and, and, and I'm up on the trumpet vine, and who drives by but my boss? And he honks the horn. I'm like, ah, yeah, yeah. You know, when our kids were in school, the teachers said, they used to have a saying, get caught being good. Don't get caught being bad. Get caught being good. And that day, I got caught being good, and I felt really good. I'm like, I love this trumpet vine. I, I, I love this ladder, you know, I love it, because I got caught, you know, doing something right. Don't you want that in your life? I've been caught doing stuff wrong. I'm not going to tell you those stories, maybe in private, depending on who you are, you know. I've been caught doing stuff wrong. I was never happy about that. It says in verse 43, dear people, please take this seriously. I know I'm kind of, you know, having a little bit of fun with you, but, but this is, this is, this, we can do that without losing the seriousness. Oh, how happy is that servant whom his master will find doing all these things. When Jesus shows up, you're like, man, I'm just so, so thankful I've been following you. I'm so thankful I haven't been playing around. I'm so thankful that I took you seriously. It's not perf I'm not talking perfection. I'm talking about an attitude. Jesus is not asking us to be perfect. He's, talk he's talking about having an outlook on life. In fact, for the person who's not perfect, which is all of us in the room, if you have that attitude, it's like you, you immediately go to this place of like, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. I know I shouldn't be you know, doing those things, thinking, saying those things, hanging out in those places. Sorry, I'm still looking for you. I'm still expecting you. Oh, how happy. Verse 45, then there's another group of people who are the unfaithful servants. So far, we've been looking at the faithful servants. Now we look at the unfaithful servants. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he's not aware And he will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. So, so far, Jesus has been speaking about the blessedness of those servants that, that believe Jesus, and, and they're, they're, they're taking it seriously, and they're, they're, they're expecting to see him. 
But now we see the, un- the unfaithful servant. Look at verse 45 again, if you would. If that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, what does that tell us about this person? He knows Jesus is coming. This, this guy, now this is, this is I, I, again, I don't know every, everything about this, but I, I'll share with you what I think is true. But this guy gets cut in half and sent to hell. He's assigned with the unbelievers. And I want to suggest to you, this guy says he's a Christian, but he's not. He's an unfaithful servant. My master delays his coming. That tells us that this guy knows. He heard Jesus say, I'm coming, be ready. And he's got it in his head, but it never changes his life. And there's a whole boatload of people all over the place that, that know these words. And there's a lot of people that maybe go to church on occasion and this and that, and, and if you ask them, do you believe Jesus is coming? Oh, yeah, I believe he's coming. But their lives look nothing like it. I, I'm glad I'm not the judge of that. But Jesus is the judge of that. This isn't, they, they don't suffer these consequences because they don't know. They do know. They absolutely know. It says it right there in verse 45. That servant says in my heart, my master is delaying his coming. And as a result, he starts mistreating people. And he starts indulging himself excessively with gluttony and with intoxication. And he, and he lives like a worldling, like Charles Spurgeon would say. He lives like a worldling. And his life looks nothing like Jesus. His life looks nothing like a follower of Jesus. This is very serious, isn't it? This is very serious. It's not knowledge, guys, that saves you. It's your, it's your belief that it's true, your belief in Jesus that saves you. There might be somebody sitting here, there might be somebody watching, you know, we're live streaming on Facebook and then it goes up on YouTube and all of that and they say, oh, you know, Bill, you're being too extreme and, you know, God is a God of love and he would never cut anybody in two and send them to hell. There it is right there. There it is right there. And I know that's not a popular message and quite honestly, I mean, I'm not at the point of tears. Sometimes I am in tears over some of my friends and over some of my loved ones. Because I can't stand the thought of them going to hell. I can't stand that thought. I hate it. And I, I don't like teaching these passages. But we have to study the whole Bible, right? We have to study the whole Bible. Otherwise, we're just making, we're just making up some nice story. John Corson is a pastor up in Oregon. And he said one time, if you don't teach the whole Bible, you just teach the fun stuff, you're fattening up the sheep for the kill. They're unprepared. They're nice and fat for when, the, for when the wolf comes. I, don't, I, I, there's, I can't even, I'm not even going to try to improve on verse 46. The master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him. Because probably in that person's life, at least for that season, there's never a day when they're looking for him. At an hour when he's not aware, they'll cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. I have to, I, if he's lumped in with the unbelievers, it's because he's an unbeliever. Dear, dear friends, you know, I, I've baptized a lot of people over the years and I've prayed with people to receive Jesus and so have you and we've, we've seen people out here, you know, and, and, and in the tub and all that and all of this and oh I'm saved and this and that and and some years later their life looks nothing like it nothing there's if I had to guess if I had to bet money if I had to bet anything I I couldn't I couldn't with any kind of confidence say oh yeah I really believe they're following Christ because their life looks nothing like it I'm not that judge and I'm really grateful I don't want to be that judge but Jesus said if they're not looking for him when he comes back they don't belong to him That's what it says. 
My heart grieves over the people that have left this church. My heart grieves over the people that have sat here and served in ministry and all of those things, and they're out in the world right now, and they look nothing like a Christian. I'm not talking perfection. I'm not saying they have to carry their Bible around all the time, but I don't, I, there's nothing that would indicate to me that they're even carrying Jesus in their heart at all. There's no indication. I mean, you don't have to follow me around very long to see me do something wrong. But if you follow me around long enough, you'll know that I'm a very imperfect person Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. I, I blow it. We all blow it. But if I hang around with you long enough, I'll see two things. I'll see you make mistakes, but I'll see you repent. And I'll know. And I'll say, yeah, me too. And we'll both say, will not it be great when Jesus comes back? And there are some people that have Bibles and they come to church and they don't, they don't even, they never think about that. They're not looking for Jesus. They don't expect him to come back. Or they're just saying, oh, he's not coming back right away. I can do whatever I want. I don't have to live in readiness. That's what the United States said. <laughs> we got pulled into a war. In verse 47, Jesus said there are degrees of punishment. That servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. When you know more, there's more expectation. There's more accountability. There's more responsibility. When you know more, you're held to a higher standard. Verse 48, he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. To me, that that says that there there are varying degrees of punishment in hell. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required, and to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. And so there are varying degrees of punishment. So, so here we are. So now you guys know. <laughs> You're thinking, oh man, I wish I would have missed church today, you know. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't. And if you take this to heart, you'll be glad too. Oh, how happy, Right? Oh, how happy is that servant that is waiting for the the return of Jesus Christ. (sighs) On the other side of the notes, on, on number four there, I think this warning is especially applicable to those who are church leaders. Because they have been given much. They started out in seminary, or they started out with a Bible in their hand. They started out serving at a church. Guys, there are liberal, ungodly, backslidden, reprobate churches in Napa. And and all over the world. There are absolute reprobate churches in Napa. And Jesus isn't there. Those are his words, not mine. If you read the book of the Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, the seven letters to the seven churches, Jesus said that he departs from churches like that. They may gather in his name, but he's not there. Because they have departed from the truth. Jesus Christ, full of truth and grace. He's gracious, he's kind, he's merciful, but not at the expense of truth. And there are pastors here in town in my opinion, as, not in my judgment, but in my opinion, as I understand this passage, they don't know Christ. They're preaching heresy. They're preaching lies. Some of you have visited those churches and you came out, and I'm glad you did. And I've been glad when some pastors have left Napa Valley because they were, they were a stain here because they preach lies. Please don't think I'm mean. I'm not mean. I mean, (laughs) I don't like cats, you know. (laughs) But this is, this is, this is just the truth. 
Jesus said in that last day, there are going to be people that come to him and they say, Lord, we fed the hungry in your name. We visited people in prison in your name. We did miracles in your name. We even cast out demons in your name. And he's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. But we, but we went to church. I wasn't there. I left your church. But we did these things in your name. Well, I bless those people, but not because of you. You never knew me. I never knew you. Depart from me into everlasting fire. Depart from me. And I think this is especially true, as I said before, for people that stand in pulpits and people that lead churches. I think there's a higher accountability. Jesus is saying here, there's a much higher accountability to whom much is given, much is required. Look at your notes there. James chapter 3, verse 1. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. You guys know that we've had a, a, a class. It's on, it's on break right now. But I've been working with some guys. We've all been working together. Scott's part of it and Joe and some other guys and Matt Scott and some other guys. And uh, they, they, they had a desire to learn how to teach the Bible. And, uh, and so we got together on a lot of Monday nights and read a book. And these, these guys have been cycling through on Sunday nights and teaching the Word of God. And a lot of time they'll say, man, I'm really nervous and I'm like, good. I'm, I'm kind of afraid. I'm like, good. You should be. You should have confidence in the Lord and none in yourself. Zero in yourself. I'm glad you're afraid. That's a good sign. If you weren't afraid, you will be later. <laughs> You'll be embarrassed later. You'll be ashamed later. You'll be humbled later. And so I really want to encourage you guys Dear, dear friends, dear, dear brothers and sisters, there have been people in this church that have a lot more knowledge than you. They know the Bible better than you. They've gone to seminary. They've gone to Bible college. They were prospective pastors. And now they're out in the world and they have nothing to do with Jesus. Don't think it can't happen to you. Don't think that you're the exception. You're not the exception. Think Satan hates, hates you less than he hated them. He's a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And if you don't live with the expectation of Jesus, and if you're, and if you're, and if you're thinking, you know, if you don't think these thoughts, if, if, you're, if you don't think on occasion like, man, what am I doing? I don't want to be found doing this when he comes. If you, don't, if you never have that thought, I would, I would encourage you, you better start thinking about it. The fear of the Lord, the Bible says, is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of man is a snare, but the fear of the Lord is the be, just the beginning of wisdom. If you don't have the fear of the Lord, you're in trouble. Down to verse 49, Jesus in, in the previous verses speaks about the faithful servant. Oh, how blessed they are. Oh, how happy. What a great day it's going to be when Jesus comes and you're like, I got caught being good. <laughs> I've been waiting for you, Lord. I'm so glad to get out of this world. I'm sick of the, of the media. I'm sick of this. I'm sick of that. I'm sick of all the sin. I'm sick of all the, the hurt and the killing and, and all, all the horrible stuff in the world. I'm so glad to see you. And another group of people that also had Bibles on their coffee table were like, I wasn't ready. I knew I should have been ready. I wasn't ready. I heard that preacher say, I should have been ready. I heard that Larry Norman song, I should have been ready. I heard my friends say I should have been ready, but I didn't take it seriously. So Jesus was comparing the faithful servants to the unfaithful servants, and now he's going to be talking about two other groups here. There are two groups of people regarding Jesus. People with discernment, those without discernment, people that accept mercy, those who don't accept mercy. Verse 49, Jesus said, I came to send fire on the earth. And how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son and son against mother, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother. Jesus said, I came to bring fire, and, and usually in the Bible, fire speaks of judgment. 
In the book of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is talking about faithful pastors and he's talking about unfaithful pastors and how they build their churches. Uh, the, the foundation of, is Jesus. So the foundation is always Jesus, at least it should be. In some churches, that, that doesn't even exist anymore. But let's say that there's, there's the foundation of a church is Jesus. And so some pastor says, you know, I've always wanted a big church. So I took a, a how to grow a big church class and uh, uh, they say if you bring in uh, really famous people and give a concert every week and give away a free car once a month and serve beer in the foyer, Seattle, Washington happens, and give away all these things and are really funny and never talk about sin and never talk about hell and just make people happy all the time, then they will come. And you can, you can get a lot of people in a church that way. You can entertain them into the church. But Jesus said it's like building with uh, wood, hay, and straw. And when the fire of God's judgment comes through, it all burns up. There's nothing to show. And another pastor who is faithfully chipping away and loving God's people and teaching the Bible and, and is not trying to build a big church, you should, you, you would be, I should send you guys the emails that I get about how to grow a church. I'm not interested in growing a church, just to let you know. I, I think our church is wonderful. Not because of us, just I just believe Jesus is working here. I'm not saying that other churches aren't wonderful. I don't pay a whole lot of attention. I just love our church. I think we have the best church in Napa. And I should think that. I should think that because this is where I am. And whoever is over at First Christian, hopefully they can say that too, that they think they have the best church because that's where they love uh, people and that's where they love. You guys know what I'm saying, right? I'm not saying we're better, but I think we should love our church. And there are churches, I'm not trying to grow a church, and the emails that I get is just, it's just crazy how to grow a church. I'm not interested in growing a church. Acts chapter 2 says, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I don't have to add, a, add anybody to the church. My pastor, Pastor Chuck Smith, said if you strive to gain, you have to strive to maintain. If you strive to get people in the door, then you got to keep them pumped up. I'm here to pump you up. I'm going to entertain you. I'm going to, oh man, we're going to have fun today. We're, ah, wah, wah, wah. you know, it's like, you know, it's like. <laughs> Church is not an entertainment center. It's a holy house where we worship the Lord and we hear his word and we love each other with pure love. And Paul says the pastor that will do that is building with gold and silver and precious stones. The foundation is Jesus, and the, but the walls are something solid, and the, when the fire of judgment comes through, it doesn't perish, and that man is rewarded. While Mr. Grow Your Big Church gets nothing in heaven, he escapes with, even, with a smell of smoke on his clothes. I'm not saying he's not saved. He just did it man's way, not God's way. And I believe that's what Jesus is talking about here in verse 49. I came to send fire on the earth. I came to, to, to set, I came to pass everything through the fire, and if it's worthy, it will pass through. If it's worthy, you can take it with you. You can take your spiritual riches with you to heaven. You can be enriched in the presence of God. If it's not worthy, if, it, if you're building a church out of styrofoam, sorry, you can't take it with you. There's nothing left. I think Jesus is also saying things like this. The ministry of, of Mr. Liberal Pastor at Mr. Liberal Church that blah, 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 blah. I just have to be careful here lest I do something wrong. I came to show you that it's not true. That pastor has to answer to me. That Christian has to answer to me. That presidential candidate has to answer to me. Those senators have to answer to me. That king has to answer to me. They throw my name around. They have a book on their, pul on their pulpit or on their coffee table. They have to answer to me. And Jesus is saying, if it can be consumed by fire, it's going to be burned up and they'll have nothing to show. But oh, how blessed is the servant. Oh, how happy is the servant that's living for me and waiting for me and looking for my return. And I believe that's what he's talking about in verse 49. And then he says, I have a baptism in verse 15 to be baptized with how distressed I am till it's accomplished. Turn, turn in your Bibles over to Matthew chapter 20, guys. Matthew chapter 20. Baptism, when, when you get baptized, you are immersed in water. 
You are immersed in something, and it's a euphemism. It's a metaphor for being immersed in something. And in Matthew chapter 20, uh, Jesus is heading towards the cross. Matthew 20, verse 20, then, mo then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said, what do you wish? And she said, oh, Jesus, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. Have special favor on my boys. But Jesus answered, verse 22, and said, you don't know what you're asking. Why, why didn't she know what she was asking? Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said, oh, we're able. In other words, are you able to go to the cross too? They had no idea what they were asking. And then he said to them in verse 23, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and my left is not mine to give. It is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. Turn back to Luke. The whole idea of baptism is Jesus is saying, I came to bring truth. I came to bring fire. And in order to do so, I have to go to the cross. And Jesus is saying, I'm ready to, I'm ready to get on with it. I'm ready to move forward. Verse 51, do you suppose I came to give peace on earth? Nope. Division. Verse 52, from now on, five in one house will be divided. So listen, you know, um, families can be difficult, can't they? They can be tricky. Fam family is tricky sometimes. But sometimes when a person becomes a Christian, um, there's division in, in the family because they like the old drug-induced, alcohol-filled you better <laughs> than the new holy decent one that doesn't cuss anymore <laughs> you know you go back into your family and it's like hey man let's do lmnop it's like no thanks i'm okay i, I got i got the joy of the lord what you're a jesus freak <laughs> you know like that's a, you know and there can be div division in a family you know christians we're not to be divisive but sometimes sometimes there's just division you just have to you just have to understand that Sometimes, though, the new you is a whole lot better, though, huh? <laughs> Raise your hand if you're a better version than you used to be. <laughs> and then you go back to your family, and it's like, man, we like having you around now, you know? So Jesus isn't saying go be divisive, but just sometimes being in him brings division. We shouldn't be surprised by that. Verse 54, then he also said to the multitudes, whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say a shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say there will be hot weather, and there is. So they could, they could read the weather patterns by looking at the sky. But then he says, hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky and of the earth. How is it you do not discern this time? You can tell when a storm's coming. You can tell... When it's going to be good weather, you can tell when it's good. You just, you're able to look at the sky and see it, but you're not able to look at me. Jesus would say this, you're not able to look at me, God in the flesh right in front of you. You're not able to figure it out. Hypocrite, guys, is not, not a Christian that tries to do good and sometimes doesn't. That's just being a Christian. A hypocrite is a pretender. It's somebody that pretends they love God, but they really don't. A hypocrite is a person that says, yeah, I'm a Christian, and I know Jesus is coming back. Yeah, I'm ready for that, but they're not living like it. That's a hypocrite, a pretender. So he's saying, you guys are pretenders. May I say it a little more harshly? You guys are liars. You say you love God, but God's standing right in front of you. And you can't even tell that it's me. You guys are hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky of the earth. How is it that you do not discern the time? Because their hearts are not for God. Their hearts are in the world. Verse 57. Yes, and why? Even of yourselves, do you not judge what is right? Now Jesus here is saying, you guys know how to discern things. It's not that you have no ability to discern things. You guys are able to discern things. He says, for instance, verse 58, when you go with your adversary to the magistrate, Make every effort along the way to settle, settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge. And the judge deliver you to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. And I tell you, you shall not depart from there till you have paid your last farthing. So, 
So I was at Whole Foods uh, parking lot, my favorite place. <laughs> when you drive into Whole Foods parking lot, I, f- I think everybody's IQ drops 50 points immediately. It's just like, it's just, you know, so, including mine. So I have a Ford uh, Explorer, it's a little bit high. And I was backing up, looking in the mirror, looking, you know, it's all this stuff. Kind of looked in this one, kind of quick. This one, wrote this one. And I backed up, and I backed up into a lady with a Volkswagen, right? She was parked, and I was just kind of scrunching out. And I scrunched her fender, and it bent it, it, you know. And she was kind of frantic, you know. And I said, I'm really sorry. I said, just, just pull over there. And she pulled over, and I, and I had my church card. And I said, listen, my fault, my fault. 100%. I'll pay you. And she goes, and I'm like, I'm a pastor. It's okay. <laughs> really, I'm a pastor. I'm not lying to you. I'm going to pay you. You send me the bill and I'll pay you. And I could have said other things and tried to fight with her. I could have done, I could have done that, but it's like, that would just be stupid. But I could have. And the old me probably would have tried to do something like that. And then she would say, well, I'm taking you to court. And then she gets a high dollar lawyer and I think I paid 300 bucks for a new fender or something like that, or 400 bucks, I don't know. But if we would have gone to court, she could have, you know, pled like pain and suffering, mental anguish, all these lost wages, all these things. Now I'm paying two or three or $4,000. So it's just smart to say, you know, let's just settle out of court. Let's settle right now. I admit that I'm wrong. You give me the terms, you tell me what you want to do, and I agree to that. And, and we don't have to go to the judge Because I'll accept your terms right now. And Jesus said, you guys know, you guys do that all the time. And then he says, you know what, the judge is coming. Why don't you take the terms that I'm offering you right now? Why do you have to wait till the judge comes? Because there's no escaping the judge. Jesus died on the cross to to pay for your sins. All you have to do is say, you know what? I've sinned against God and I've sinned against man and I deserve the judgment of God and I'm sorry, God forgive me and he forgives you and he makes you born again and you're on your way to heaven. Those are his terms. Those are reasonable terms, don't you think? All you have to do is admit you've sinned. Not that you had a boo-boo or not that you're born Irish and you have a temper or... You know, or that, not that you stubbed your toe emotionally or spiritually. You need, you need to say, you know what? I deserve God's judgment, but Christ died for me. I accept that. Those are his terms. I'm not going to go try to argue with the judge. I'm not that stupid. I'm not that dumb. I can accept his terms right now. Oh, how happy is the man. Oh, how happy is the woman that just does those things that Jesus says. But if you don't, verse 58, when you go with your adversary to the magistrate, make every effort along the way to settle with them, or else he'll drag you to the judge, and the judge will deliver you to the officer, and the officer will throw you into prison. And I tell you, you shall not depart from there until you've paid your very last mite. How long do you have to pay for your sins in hell? Forever. Forever. That's what the Bible says. We're, we're not making this up, are we? This isn't, this isn't how to build a big church, is it? This isn't how to make people happy. This is how to bring people uh, into eternal life. This is how to give people a clear conscience. Isn't that worth something? A cleansed conscience? Isn't it worth it to get rid of the shame and the guilt? To not have to cover it up anymore? Isn't it worth it to not have to buy another self-help book to try to change yourself? Just give your life to Christ. He'll change you. He'll forgive you. He'll give you a new nature. He'll make you want to do holy stuff. Right? (laughs) He'll give you the power to do holy and good things. He'll give you power to heal, not to, well, sometimes to heal people, to forgive people and to ask for forgiveness. He changes. He makes you born again. He makes you a new creature. Settle with the the judge now take his terms right now that's what jesus is saying 
So I would encourage everybody in the room, accept Christ today. And if you've already accepted him, that's fantastic. He's coming. People get ready. Jesus is coming. That doesn't mean I need to live in fear and all freaked out and all, you know, just spinning out in my mind all the time. It's just like, no, I'm forgiven. Man, I, I am so glad that I'm forgiven. I'm so glad to be a Christian. I'm so glad to not be so mixed up anymore. I'm so glad that he's healing me still. And I'm so glad it doesn't depend on me. And so I live my life, we live our lives, but we've got one ear listening for the knock on the door when he comes to receive us. Let me pray for us. Thank you for your terms, Lord. It cost you so much. Thank you for your great love, Jesus, that you would step out of heaven, you'd lay your glory aside and put on flesh and walk among us and be accused and mistreated and abused and beaten and killed and all of those things because the courts of heaven demand payment and you made the payment for us. And now we, can, uh, we are free to accept your terms, Lord. And I pray that everybody in this room today accepts your terms, Lord that we would just simply admit that we deserve your judgment, but you don't want to judge us. But you will, but you don't want to. And so, Lord, I pray for every life here that they would just simply say yes to you. And for those of us, Father, that um, have said yes to your son, that, we, that we'd take it seriously, that we wouldn't give you lip service, but we'd give you heart service. So thank you, Lord, for this group. Thank you for each one here today. And we do pray for our city, Lord. We love our city and we want people to be saved. And we pray for every church that Jesus would be preached accurately and forcefully and wonderfully and powerfully and lovingly and graciously. And that your word, God, would be opened up to every person in every pulpit. And Lord, we pray for a, a revival in your church, God. May there be a return to, uh, to, the, to the truths of the Bible. May there be a return, Lord, to a holy fear of God. May there be a departure, Lord, from, uh, from deviations, Lord, from your word. May the leaders in the churches of Napa, God, have a fear of God, a holy reverence for you, not of people, but of you. And then you can pour out your blessings, Lord. So bless our city, we pray, God. And bring revival to your church and bring awakening to the unsaved. And use us, Lord, and may it start with us, God. So thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Oh, any questions? You can start to stand slowly if you'd like. <laughs> oh, my. Will you comment on children who have had an understanding of the gospel and believe and ask Jesus to be their Savior? but then grow up and hear new ideas in the world or college and are persuaded that the gospel is lacking, are they saved? Will the Holy Spirit chase them down ultimately? Yeah, how many of us have been chased right here? It's good to be slow so you can get caught. You go, go ahead and sit down for a minute here. We teach our kids about Jesus from a very young age, and I think that's a tremendous advantage. But, but eventually, they have to make their own decision if they're going to follow Christ or not. And so I know that there have been children, you know, young kids and teenagers baptized in our church over the years, and there doesn't appear to be any evidence of them walking with Christ. God knows. I don't know. But Jesus knows, and they, they need to know that they're following Jesus. So are they saved? You know, Paul tells Timothy, the Lord knows those who are his. And I hope they're saved. I accepted Christ at 16, and I went off the deep end for, for six years. Just didn't look anything like a Christian. And God was faithful and came after me, man. He chased me down and brought me back. So where, where are they in that path of life? I don't know. We, we don't know. But I believe the Holy Spirit, yeah, is, is a good hound dog. I think it was Billy Graham that talked about the hounds of heaven. You know, the, the hound, you guys know what a hound dog does, right? Chases raccoons and stuff. I think the hounds of heaven chase people down. I do believe that very much. Question. 
Does this text be ready refer to giving your heart to Jesus or is it more the active living of being ready? I think, I think this, this particular passage it speaks about the act of living of being ready. But certainly, certainly it does include he, the way to start being ready is to say yes to Christ. So that's, that's the first thing. Are the people who weren't ready and, and grouped with the unbelievers once saved? It's the gazillion dollar question, isn't it? You know, there are churches in our valley that, 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 that throw around the, the term once saved and always saved, you know. I don't think you can lose your salvation, but I think you can walk away from it. I do believe that. Because there's a lot of verses that say you need to endure till the end. So that's where I'm at. I think if I tried to walk away from Jesus right now, he'd, he would literally break my legs. And I'm not kidding, and I'm grateful for that. Because some, you know, Sometimes we need, we need those disciplines from the Lord so that we realize this is not a, a joke, that this is serious. And I belong to Jesus, and I've felt his disciplining hand before, and I'm grateful for it. That's why I'm here, because of the disciplining hand of God. That's why I'm here. And a lot of you, too, you, you've felt that spanking, and we need it. So I think there are people that have said yes to Christ, and apparently they were his, and it doesn't appear like apparently they are now. I don't know. Just don't let yourself be that person. Amen? Let's stand. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and free. God bless you guys. Please stay for lunch if you can.